Okay, well, let's, we're at time. We'll get started. Um, hi, my name is Adam Miller. I'm on the uh, Ansible core engineering team at Red Hat. I, before that, have been uh, on the Fedora engineering team, and I've been a Fedora community member uh, since roughly, been a contributing Fedora community member since roughly 2008. Um, <clears throat> been a long time user, been doing stuff here and there. Uh, but I want to talk today about advanced Ansible, extending Ansible through plugins. Uh, we're going to kind of talk about a uh, quick outline, uh, why this matters to Fedora, why this is you know being presented here, uh, some Ansible internals, plugin types and examples, how to write a plugin, and how to contribute a plugin. If you find something uh, that is very useful, you think that might be useful for other users out in the Ansible community. Uh, so. Uh, why advanced Ansible at Flock? Well, quick is a history lesson. So uh, Ansible and Fedora shared history. Um, so for starters, Ansible was created by Michael DeHaan, who has history in uh, Fedora, and then uh, actually, as well, uh, Red Hat Emerging Technologies, uh, Adrian Likens, uh, Greg DeConisberg, and Seth Vidal, uh, Greg Deck being um, a Fedora project leader, and uh, Seth Vidal um, being the original author of Yum, longtime Fedora country member uh, before he tragically passed. Um, uh, and then so Funk also, does anybody remember Funk from Fedora infrastructure team? Like, okay, two, three. Uh, so Funk was a tool that was kind of created once upon a time to do this concept of orchestration uh, within the environment, ad hoc tasks, those kind of things. Um, but it was based on a message bus and these various different architectural uh, decisions. And uh, Ansible was born kind of from some of those concepts mixed with other concepts learned and things. But uh, as far as a history of technology and as far as the concepts that came into the design and implementation of Ansible, many of those things actually stemmed from experience gained in the Fedora community as well as directly from Fedora community members input. Uh, the other thing is the Fedora, Fedora infrastructure team actually started using Ansible since it was created because uh, Seth at the time was on the Fedora infrastructure team and uh, he was part of the influence and in, uh, the creation of the project. They initially started off very quickly using it for ad hoc tasks, things like that. Over time it eventually it replaced uh, Puppet for um, full end-to-end -end configuration management, automation and things in the Fedora infrastructure. Uh, Fedora CI and QA, so uh, things that Seth Walters and those folks work on um, Tim Flink and those those groups are working uh, with Ansible as well. Uh, also, our friends over, not directly related to Fedora, but our friends over in OpenStack, uh, if anybody's familiar with Zool, the CI system, Zool is completely implemented using Ansible, uh, as well as all of their tests being written in Ansible. Uh, does anybody remember Jenkins Job Builder? Jen yeah, so Jenkins Job Builder, the OpenStack team, uh, actually implemented a translation layer that turned Jenkins job templates into Ansible, and that's when they moved Zool to Zool v3, and it's all Ansible powered. Um, so just a, an example, another example of CI efforts. Uh, Fedora Release Engineering does some workflow uh, automation. That was some work that I was involved in uh, a while back where uh, we started actually doing uh, workflow automation because there, there was these you know, decade-old shell scripts that have been sitting around that were just kind of have to limp along, and it just kind of made sense to try and, and move that stuff along to something that was a little bit more, in, more maintainable, a little more general use. Um, can be more easily contributed to. Um, other aspects of the Fedora project, uh, last I checked, we're kind of evaluating where it would work. I don't know who's actually using it widespread. If everybody wa saw uh, Matt Miller's talk this morning with the, the web graph of, you know, the 37 odd different sub projects in Fedora, um, I didn't survey everybody, sorry. Um, and uh, the advanced use of Ansible through plugins and things, doing well, um, <coughs> using Ansible plugins to extend the functionality to better integrate with different systems you might be using. So, for example, uh, the QA team, they use Fabricator. You know, there's potentially some integration points where we could actually interact directly with Fabricator based on um, actions uh, during runtime of a playbook, based on um, some input or some, you know, side effect of, of an automation component executing. Uh, we could, you know, update their tickets. We could update different aspects of their, um, their planning, whatever. Um, similarly with you know github or if you're you know doing IRC bots those kinds of things we can actually interact with those as well um, we have some plugins built in today that'll do those sorts of things but if you know there's a, a component that you need or that's going to be custom tailored to a specific workflow somewhere in the Fedora project uh, plugins and, and those kind of things will be useful there so uh, we're gonna go through Ansible internals 101 just kind of give an uh, overview of how some of the stuff comes together how it might be useful to you uh, in things you're doing in Fedora 
So quick refresher, or uh, a quick refresher, because um, I can talk, I promise. Um, <clears throat> Ansible is an agentless, item potent task automation tool. Um, task functionality is provided by modules, and modules are technically a type of plugin, but they're special. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Tasks are grouped together via plays. A play operates on a set of hosts. Hosts are indexed by an inventory. Playbooks can contain one or more plays, and a role is a bundled, reusable set of files, templates, variables, and tasks. Is any of this news to anybody? Everybody hopefully familiar with Ansible, using it? Yes? Cool? Cool? Not a bunch of head nods? Wonderful. Oop, went over jump. Okay, now, um, how Ansible works under the hood. Uh, when you run Ansible, or Ansible Playbook, uh, more specifically, it's going to parse and load an inventory. It will parse and load the playbook or playbooks in the event of includes and in things uh, or uh, a role. For each play in the playbooks, it will then for each task in the play, and then it will for each host filtered on your, your host group uh, filters and things like that. Uh, it will then run the task on the host and read the results. Uh, during each of these steps, one or more plugin types are used. So the plugins are actually taking action during the execution on each host depending on what's in your playbook. So conditionally, based on what's actually happening during the automation, is going to depend on which plugins are in play. Some of them are always in play, and we'll kind of we'll kind of walk through some of that stuff. So the plugin system, there's a top top cl uh, top class uh, loader called the plugin loader. So this is responsible for um, I keep kicking this thing, and it's probably not great because it's kind of jiggling the display. I'm sorry. Um, it's responsible for loading uh, all all of the other uh, types for of plugins. Uh, it also, uh, like I noted before, modules are technically plugins. They're just kind of special uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, it does actually load modules, but it only finds them. It doesn't actually load them because we don't load uh, plugins on, or we don't load modules on the controller. Um, since Ansible 2.4, plugins can declare their own requirements. Uh, so if you're a plugin author, you can actually declare your requirements, and those can be exposed to be configurable to an end, uh, end system administrator. And as of 2.5, on the control host, you can actually um, uh, explicitly enable or disable uh, specific uh, plugins on your control host as a system administrator, if you would like to. So, uh, modules shipped in Ansible are in lib Ansible plugins by default. That's going to be universal if you installed from an RPM or PIP or you extract a tarball and you're running from source. <coughs> uh, the main plugin class uh, lives in the uh, init inside of that directory. Uh, and then you can do custom uh, defined uh, plugins through um, the type of plugin underscore plugins. So. We have these types of plugins, and these, this is just an ls-1 uh, of uh, libansible plugins. So action cache, callback, CLI conf, connection filter, HTTP API, inventory, uh, lookup, net conf, shell, strategy, terminal, test, and vars. Any of those, and then underscore plugins, you can have a directory name that, and then Ansible will search for um, plugins in that directory of that type, or you can actually do custom uh, definitions in your configuration file if you want. Something to note is some of these aren't actually going to be general use. They're going to be specific for Ansible networking. So for those who are not familiar, Ansible has networking extensions to uh, configure um, network gear, physical network gear, Juniper, Cisco, um, uh, Palo Alto. I'm not a networking person. I'm sh leaving out a whole whole bunch of them. But um, so some of those aren't going to be directly uh, useful for necessarily people in the Fedora uh, ecosystem who are gen probably generally going to be doing things with sy systems and doing system administration and automation tasks, things like that. Um, so just kind of take note. Some of these are going to not directly be applicable, and as such, we're not going to go through them today. Uh, also, in the interest of time. So. Um, special cases. Modules are loaded. Okay, th I mentioned this earlier. Uh, I forgot which slide it was on. Um, <coughs> modules are loaded through the plugin loader, but we don't actually uh, execute them or into the into the Python uh, runtime at the time. Uh, documentation fragments. So there are uh, special cases in which um, files are basically documentation fragments that can get, then get mer merged with other sets of documentation. Uh, instead of with their direct code place, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. But um, so doc strings used in common code and module common, those kinds of things, uh, those are there. I forgot to mention at the beginning of the slide. I just realized I didn't. Um, uh, James Camarada, I, I stole most of the slide deck from him. 
Uh, I, I have a little attribution down here because uh, he, he wrote it. Uh, those who aren't familiar, it goes by Jimmy C on, on uh, GitHub or the Jimmy C on Twitter. Uh, he is uh, Ansible's BDFL since uh, Mike left. Uh, anyway, so uh, the first type of plugin we're going to talk about is an action plugin. And the action plugin is very interesting from the aspect of um, if you are working with a module or you've written a module. Actually, really quick note, show of hands, who's written a module? OK, four or five. Um, <clears throat> so an example of a, a module would be the DNF module. So you have a task, DNF, name, uh, uh, bash, state, installed. Um, an action plugin is effectively a module that runs controller side. You, you can invoke an action plugin just like you would invoke a module, but it takes action on the local system. And you can actually overload that and have both an action um, plugin and a module uh, name the same thing, and you can have them interact together. And an example of that uh, would be the um, Oh my gosh, I'm going to blink on this. The sync? Pretty sure it's the synchronize. Yeah. yeah. So synchronize, um, so for example, it has to actually do some things on the local host that, you, that you're that you doing controlling from. So um, it needs to you know find some files, probably find rsync, do some things, and then it needs to contact the remote system. So you would do an action plugin if for some reason you need to, on your local host, perform a task, like tar up a local directory before sending it, sending it across the wire to the remote system. And if you want to do all of that without having to require your user or your team to create a set of tasks to do those individual things one by one and then do that, you just kind of want to have it handled in a round trip, single task definition in your playbook, an action plugin is there, for, to, there to enable that. So uh, if an action plugin by the same name, um, the action plugin is used, and then um, otherwise, you know, the normal remote execution of the module will happen. Uh, so an example is um, which one is this? I don't know which one is. Okay, so <clears throat> basically, is you. Everything starts with the base. So there's a base class for each uh, plugin type. So for action plugin, there's action base. For um, you know shell plugin, there's shell base. Those kinds of things. And you so you subclass it, and then everything's going to have a definition of run. Uh, that's going to be kind of our invocation point. And something to note is, is that's kind of special to the action module is you have an execute module. So if for some reason you are actually defining an Ansible action module, or I'm sorry, an actual an action plugin, and you need to invoke the module with the same name. Um, and I think a really good example of this is the package. Um, we're gonna really quickly. Why did it? Okay. We're gonna do this. Wish I had that. internet and I can't connect to my demo box anymore. That's cool. Okay, well anyways, we'll just walk through this uh, instead. <clears throat> so <clears throat> taskbars is going to be um, the dictionary that we get uh, by, by doing the, the super module, or I'm sorry, the super invocation of our parent class, and that's how we're going to get actually the variables that are passed. So again, if we were using um, the example of, of DNF as our task, so task name equals bash, state equals install, those would be sent into that dictionary. You would get those as the arguments that get sent in. You can actually um, use those for making decisions in your action plugin programmatically through Python. Uh, and then if something that you need to do actually will um, execute a module, you can then pass those into uh, that module because executing the module 
um, needs those arguments passed into it. So this would be, exam for example, the implementation of the task um, and how that gets executed through the ANSI internals. Um, and then uh, you you would need to actually report those results in the same way that you, re you report your module results, uh, which is the return results. And that's going to be the JSON structure that Ansible re expects to return. Because the module itself executes and returns JSON. Um, so for an action plugin, because an action plugin is effectively um, implemented in a way that's meant to be used as a module locally on the on the control host, we have to handle that. Sorry. Yes. Very quickly, why are you uh, removing the Ansible notify from the results? That is a uh, historic thing, and we have documentation in the uh, Devel docs that just says you need to do this, and I don't remember why. Uh, I think the reason to do that predates me as, as somebody who mucks around in code. Um, but I'm not actually sure. There's, there's, a, uh, there's a reason somewhere. Do you remember? Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. Uh, but yeah, in, in, the, in the Devel docs it says you, just, you need to do this because uh, I think it was part of the Ansible 1.9 to 2.0 transition. Like somewhere in there, which like we don't need this anymore, so always delete it. So we're not because every time um, just uh, the question. Sorry to repeat for the sake of the recording. The question was why do we have to delete results invocation module args? Um, and the the reason is I don't I don't remember, but I know that we need to do this, and I believe it was part of the Ansible 1.9 to 2.0 transition because every time the results gets copied around, there are various points in the Ansible runtime that do a deep copy. So that entire dictionary structure would be continuously copied over and over again. And it won't add up to a whole lot of data unless you get into the world of like a large inventory or something where you're doing a lot of dynamic um, reevaluation of variables. Because then we just keep deep, deep copying it recursively and then you can run into memory problems. Um, so I, I believe it's just kind of those like, get it out of here because we don't need it. Okay. Uh, so callback plugins. I think callback plugins are probably the most common for system administrators. Um, and they're used to act on events which occur during the execution of playbooks. So you can, um, for example, at the start of a playbook run or at the success of a task or um, anytime there's output, you can take action. So this, is, this allows us to do like custom logging events. This allows us to do chat ops because when something starts, you can have it kick off some message to your IRC bot or your Slack bot or whatever you're using. Um, so you have multiple callbacks, uh, and and they're all configured in the Ansible config file. Uh, you can set uh, multiple of them to run, <coughs> and oh yeah, uh, the the callbacks that do output to the to the screen to your local terminal, uh, you can't overload those because uh, that gets weird. The one at nine x note, I. Didn't, I thought about deleting this, but I thought just on the off chance somebody's hopefully not, but maybe still doing a 1.9 one, one to 2.0 transition, um, there was a configuration uh, component added. So in 2.0, we decided to, to add the different events. I did leave this in there because uh, if you're copying around callback uh, plugins that have been around in the, the ether for a long time, you're potentially going to see an on playbook start versus a v2 on playbook start. That's all compatibility stuff. For the most part, um, anything you're writing today, when you write a callback plugin, should be doing the v2 underscore. But the v, the old the old implementation still works. So if you do find a little callback plugin, we maintain compatibility moving forward for those. Um, so is that really my cut? Oh. Uh, okay. Anyways. Um, so you have your callback module, which is again going to do the callback base, um, and then your callback version should be 2.0. Um, and your callback type, um, there's different kind of types. Um, callback name. So the callback name is going to be how you identify in the configuration file, uh, and then your plugin uh, needs a whitelist. So this is going to be about whether or not it's enabled by default, or if you have to add it uh, explicitly to the configuration. And I really wish. Is this working? Ha! All right, hold on.
So, actually, let me hold the mic. Yeah, okay. All right, so our callback module here um, has the, the definition of the version, the name, those kind of things. So this is the profile tasks. Uh, so it's going to kind of go through and, and do some uh, some statistics. But we have a, a handful of definitions here. So playbook on uh, on where am I? Oh, on task start um, on handler task start. Uh, so again, you, so you have your tasks in a playbook, then you have your handlers, and if we're trying to profile all of those things, we want to make sure to take action based on um, based on that. So um, inside of here, we have a couple of uh, internal uh, methods that will record the task, um, so that we can display the uh, the different metrics, and then we're going to display information on setup and then on stats. So you have different action points or different uh, basically schedulable moments throughout uh, a playbook execution where you can actually run some action. And so for the full like run through, you have so here we go. Here's the V2. So you have um, runner um, on async poll, you have on async OK, async failed, playbook start, uh, start, notify, host match, host remaining, um, task start, cleanup, handler, vars prompt. So there, there are a lot of defined points throughout the execution where you can actually have an inflection point to take action based on something that's occurring. Um, and you have a considerable amount of uh, uh, access to to the the information about the context in which the execution is going. So the goal here is to allow uh, you to get introspection into your your execution of a playbook through through callbacks. Okay. Yeah, this this got chopped off. There's supposed to be another slide with like some of the the. Um, different examples of uh, function calls. Okay, so uh, connection plugins. So connection plugins are used to provide the transport layer between Ansible and, and whatever you're connecting to. Um, so they're, rel they're relatively simple. You have a connect, execute command, put file, get file, disconnect. Uh, and the goal there is to make it easy to write, easy to implement, and easy to extend to Ansible to do things other than just an SSH connection. The most often used connection types for uh, sysadmins are gonna be local and SSH. Uh, but there's there's quite a few of them. <coughs> uh, so we actually have a uh, we have a Chirrut transport. Um, so you can actually also define pipelining. So for those who are not familiar, the pipelining functionality allows you to pipeline some of the uh, commands together. And uh, for SSH, that means you're able to use multiplexing and those kinds of things. Um, so um, this again just kind of like drops off there. Kubernetes, we have a kubectl um, connection plugin for anybody talking to Kubernetes. You can actually talk uh, directly to Kubernetes over this connection plugin. Um, so it's got its init function, uh, and then we go through and then we define uh, exec command. So that's how to exec execute the command over um, the uh, the connection and. Uh, we have our put file, we have our fetch file and are closed. So uh, the idea is everything else, all the other code in there is simply at service of de defining these required uh, methods. And then at the point in time that the execution runs, it simply calls the appropriate plugin. Uh, and so you can kind of dream up, just based on uh, everything that we have right now, you can kind of dream up whatever you want or whatever might be necessary or useful. So we've got uh, build a Chirrut, Docker, um, Funk D, HTTP API. Um, those kinds of things. So network CLI. So again, like that's going to be in service of you know network routers and things, switches. Um, so not might not necessarily be very useful to you, but we have a considerable uh, number of different connection plugins. And if you have some type of system you're trying to connect directly to without trying to do like an SSH jump through and run weird commands or something, you can actually do those those kinds of things natively with connection plugins. 
So strategy plugins, plugins, these are probably the hardest to write, they're the most laborious to do. Um, but by default, when you run Ansible, the way that it actually executes is in order task execution. And what we mean by in order is every host that matches the host group that you're running against for your play, each task will wait to move to the next task for every host in the inventory uh, matched group to finish. So if you have that DNF uh, you know, name state state installed and you have 100 hosts, that task will not move on to the next, next task in the play until all 100 hosts have checked back in. That's going to be linear. Um, then there's free. Free, is, free basically says every task in the play, every host just go out and do it as fast as you can and then at the end of the playbook or at the, at the end of the play we'll wait for you all to check in. We're not worried about each task individually. Um, and then there's a debug, which just subclasses linear and gives you all, all kinds of uh, debug functionality. If it hits a problem, it'll actually drop to a debug console. Um, but you can kind of do whatever you want. You can, you can get really, really creative, uh, but do note that from a, a development standpoint, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get pretty, um, it's gonna pretty off the weeds, and you kind of uh, are left with a little bit of, uh, if you break it, you buy it. <laughs> from from an execution standpoint, the I I would be amazed that many people need to extend or do something uh, different here, um, but the option is there, uh, and and so this was new in 2.0, and and if you really want to get creative, and if you just have a, a wild idea for uh, the actual execution strategy of of how your playbooks run, you have that that flexibility if you want it. This thing's got weird feedback. There we go. Uh, so lookup plugins. I think lookup plugins are also very common, um, aside from callback plugins. Uh, so, <coughs> for example, uh, just really quick, we'll just go. So um, lookup plugins are used in two ways traditionally. So the template uh, for templating variables, and then also for loops on tasks. Um, Jimmy's not a fan uh, of of the loops on tasks. But if you use the with items, uh, it actually loads the the item.py uses the lookup plugin to to find variables and that kind of thing. But um, this is going to be a very common pattern. Who who is familiar that you could actually template variables in line in your in your play in your playbooks to do lookups of various things? Okay, about half. All right, cool. So um, uh, just since we're why not? We'll just kind of for kicks pull an audible if uh, DNS maybe maybe. Nope, just kidding. I was going to show you some docs and some examples, but I'm going to lie to you instead. Um, okay, so the main thing with lookup plugins is it's always going to run on the controller. This does not ever run remotely. Um, and that's important uh, from the perspective of if you think for some reason you're looking up information contextually about the host you're remotely executing a task on, uh, don't think that because you will not get expected results. Um, I think I've got, hold on, I think I've got, Uh, yeah. Magic. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Can I read that? Yeah. All right. So um, we have uh, plugin lookup plugins for all sorts of things. So you can get AWS account attributes. Um, you can do Cartesian products of lists, um, chef things. Uh, so you can really read environment variables. You can get the file, the contents of files. So for some reason, you want to read a file contents into a variable at runtime without having to store that information in playbooks. A look at the lookup plugin for that is very useful. Um, another one that I think is is very useful that people aren't very familiar with is the pipe, uh, reading the output from a command. Uh, so the example of that. Uh, is you can literally just say look up pipe and then run the command like date or um, add things there. Uh, 
so that's basically the ability to just run some arbitrary command. It store its output as as your uh, as a variable at runtime in line uh, for it's a templated variable. So um, not not directly plugin writing related, but just it, there wasn't nearly as many people who knew about lookup plugins. I uh, thought so. I wanted to at least mention those. Okay, so lookup plugin example. So again, we have our run. Uh, I think this is actually. For, yeah, this is the pipe. So this is the pipe lookup plugin. So basically, you, it just it just runs a sub process. Uh, it goes ahead and runs the command that you asked for. It gets the information and then it returns it returns that. And then the, when the plugin loader runs it at the templated variable, it just inputs it in line where that where that templated uh, variable value would be. Um, so again, so we have a lookup module. Um, it subclasses lookup base, and then we have to provide a run method and um, the code for this is relatively, you know, simple. So you pass in some terms for term and terms. You want to make sure it's, you know, stream validated. Run it uh, as a subprocess. Do a communication to the subprocess. Um, make sure that our return code is zero, um, so that we're not. Um, <coughs> probably should have. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, make sure our return code is zero, so we're not returning failed things, or else, uh, you know, go ahead and offer a meaningful error message. Um, otherwise, we would get the error message as the templated variable uh, value, and that's probably not what users want. Um, <coughs> so filter and test plugins. So filter and tests uh, extend the Jinja 2 templating system for Ansible. Um, so filters are used to transform data. So everybody familiar with the pipe uh, syntax of doing filters in uh, Jinja, and then tests are used to validate data. Um, filter and tests, so uh, an example, so again, um, oh, that filter module's, that example's outdated. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's wrong. No, okay, it should not come back. If it comes back, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so cache plugins, uh, so for fact caching, cache plugins are used to store uh, gathered fact data outside of local memory. Um, and this can be useful for uh, systems that aren't going to change very frequently if you don't want to actually have to regather that fact information. Um, you don't actually have to do anything beyond configuring a fact cache uh, plugin. You don't have to go through and modify your playbooks or anything. Um, Ansible itself will actually go ahead and handle this. But um, if there is a, a fact caching, or uh, if there's a data system that you want to store your fact cache in that Ansible doesn't per currently provide a plugin to uh, offer that functionality, you can extend Ansible through a, fa uh, a um, cache plugin to um, store the information in that, in that backend data store, uh, whatever that may be. Uh, I'm trying to think of one that we don't have. Cassandra? React? Um. <coughs> So again, uh, base cache. So base cache module for cache module, um, you need to have your get set keys contains and delete, uh, and that's basically uh, as long as you could provide uh, provide that basic functionality, the rest of it we can handle because we can do a uh, comparison to make sure that the backend data store has values, uh, and then we can get set add and delete uh, based on those. Uh, shell plugins. <coughs> These are, sorry, it's very warm in here. Um, <coughs> shell plugins are used to properly format commands for remote execution. Um, so an example of that's going to be like POSIX SH or FISH shell. Uh, anybody FISH shell? Show hands. All right, three, three. Okay. Um, so yeah. So for those who didn't know, uh, Ansible will support FISH shell. Um, so it was originally written uh, to make handling SSH versus WinRM uh, less painful, but it's been extended for all sorts of uh, interesting things. I think we d directly support Debian's ASH, um, which I think is, what, Alchemist shell? ASH. Um, Fish, uh, a handful of others, I think CSH. Um, yeah, so we have uh, various different implementations to, to offer that. 
Um, so this is a little bit uh, more laborious in terms of doing uh, common common shells, the shell family, uh, embedded uh, end of life, the null. You kind of just have to define the group of what uh, what's different or what you, is unique about that shell environment. Um, and then these different variables get used throughout the construction of commands and those kinds of things inside of Ansible itself that when when a command has to be run uh, that we can't just implement directly or, or makes less sense to implement directly in Python, these are used. Uh, and then um, you just uh, define the env prefix. Any, anybody have a, any wild suggestions for a shell that we might not have? All right. Um, I don't know how common this is necessarily in real world use from a system administrator standpoint, but uh, just know that we have that there. Uh, so how to write plugins. So anytime Ansible, or I'm sorry, first off, should I write a plugin? So um, <clears throat> if Ansible doesn't do what you need it to and you need to connect to a system, um, fetch data external to Ansible, uh, store or retrieve facts from a centralized system, which would be our fact caching, um, do custom actions, which is going to be a callback plugin, um, or, or make Ansible execute tasks in a pattern that we have not thought of, which can be a strategy uh, plugin. If, if you find yourself in any of these situations, that's when you are a prime candidate for writing Ansible plugins. Um, otherwise, there's probably a module or a plugin or something uh, built in. Um, or available on Galaxy, and you don't actually have to. Always search Galaxy first. Um, but anyway, so the power of, of Ansible is, is its simplicity and its extensibility. So we have the opportunity to do these things. Um, so always use the, the provided base classes. Uh, number one, there's a lot of kind of um, standard generic structural um, uh, methods defined in there that are meant to help you implement these things so you're not having to reinvent those wheels. Um, beyond that, uh, it won't get loaded if you don't uh, load off the base class. Why does this keep doing this? Um, testing debugging plugins, so unit tests, uh, since it's relatively easy to load um, the, the classes, please provide unit tests if you're going to contribute uh, your test up to Ansible. Uh, unit tests are great, integration tests are also um, uh, appreciated from a standpoint of our testing, we try to favor integration tests, um, mostly because as long as the functionality or the end result of Ansible's execution of a playbook uh, mirrors what a, a user would expect, it doesn't really matter what you did, the internal structure or the internal code. Uh, but unit tests are great. Please, if, you know, if you're doing really wild things like a strategy plugin, you probably test or two. Um, so, so we have a, uh, this is an example of a lookup module. Um, why did this? Uh, come on. Ironically, yeah, here we go. Yeah, okay, so we have CSH fish shell SH. And I lost it again. That's awesome. Okay, well, that's been useless. Ugh. All right. Um, well, I had a I had some code I wanted to walk through there, but doesn't seem to be my day. All right, um, so a handful of guidelines for contributing uh, plugins back to Ansible. Uh, so coding guidelines, uh, is for GPL3 is required um, with an asterisk on it. Module Utils has been kind of a grab bag of licenses uh, in recent years. Um, but plugins themselves should be GPL3. Um, docs are, are basically required. Uh, not all the plugin types have documentation sections, but you need to at least have um, some something useful in terms of comments or doc strings, those kind of things for your functions, uh, just because of what's going on. Familiarize yourself with the modules available um, and some of the stuff in the base classes because there's a reasonable chance that you will implement something that's already been done. Uh, and then if you submit a code review, 
you'll be asked to not do that. Um, so we have uh, Google Groups as our, our development forum, uh, Ansible Develop on Freenode if anybody has any questions. And then uh, there's two core team meetings a week. So every Tuesday and Thursday, we actually have a core community team meeting on IRC um, that anyone can add things to the agenda to on, uh, on GitHub. And uh, please do that because anytime there's a decision that needs to be made, anytime there's questions about a review that people have, uh, if there's any kind of um, uh, debate about a decision in which something should go or people need advisement that they are not getting just from the general develop discussions, that kind of thing, uh, the core contributors are there. Uh, and something to note is that as far as core, core contributors go, uh, I believe it's about half and half now. I think about half the core contributors work for Red Hat, about half the core contributors are community-based, uh, but it's not just Red Hatters who have direct get access to, uh, to the code base these days. I think it's somewhere in the ballpark of like 30 people and about 15 of them work for Red Hat. So um, yeah, we're doing doing better there. Uh, so questions? No. All right. Cool. Well, um, seven to spare. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, so modules, so modules are kind of a special thing because uh, they are are loaded like a plugin, such that um, they have certain attributes like their indexing and their configuration, those kind of things. But they aren't actually implemented like a plugin because plugins are loaded uh, directly as Python classes or subclasses, whereas modules aren't inherently. Modules are actually um, loaded as Python submodules and subclasses when they're written in Python, but they're not required to be written in Python. You can write a module in PowerShell or Ruby or Java or C if you feel like it. Um, a module just has to accept um, and return JSON as input and output. Uh, so you can write it in any language you want. And that's why they're special, um, because we have this, um, this implementation thing called Antiball Z, which is a, a tip of the hat to Dragon Ball Z, for those of our anime, f um, which will actually allow you to basically package up and, and bundle um, a module to be sent over the wire written in any language. Um, and the idea there is to allow module development to be flexible, because what majority of people are doing, the majority of people are writing is going to be modules. Let me back up. Majority of people are writing playbooks or roles. Um, slightly less people will be writing modules for custom functionality. Considerably less people are going to be writing a strategy plugin or, you know, a cache cash plugin, that kind of thing. So the, you know, the flexibility in the range um, kind of in terms of implementation for for proper plugins, which is you know kind of what we went through today, uh, those are written in Python, whereas modules themselves have a lot of flexibility to them um, in terms of what you can do. So the the stip the only stipulation that was ever placed on a module was that it has to accept and return JSON. Um, the big kicker beyond that, though, is for a module to be accepted into upstream Ansible, it has to be implemented in Python. Or PowerShell, the Windows the Windows modules are written in PowerShell. I always I, sorry Windows people, I always forget. I don't mean to. I just forget that you exist. You know that's that's quite common. And instead, I was asking I'm about to ask how to write plugins uh, for Windows because I use Linux, but I in my time I required to manage uh, some Windows servers. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so the question was, uh, how do you write plugins for Windows? The answer is you don't. Um, the plugins, is because, and the reason I say that is because the plugins run controller side, and Ansible is only supported controller side on Linux. Um, so plugins themselves are always going to run controller side on the Linux system. Modules, however, modules are written in PowerShell for Windows. Yeah, in PowerShell. Yeah. And we have native, so from an Ansible perspective, we have native support for PowerShell for module authoring. And the, mo and the modules are what uh, carry what p provide functionality for the task execution in a playbook. Um, so that's yeah. So modules themselves can be written in PowerShell uh, to to try to do the native stuff with uh, with the local or the, with, with the remote Windows host. Um, yeah. I have a follow up question. Follow up question. Go. Yeah. So uh, since we can write custom modules on our own, so where do we put it in the directory hierarchy? 
Uh, so the question was, uh, where do we put modules that we've written our own? Um, so you can put it in your module path, you, which you can define your configuration or at the command line. You can put it in the default module path, which is um, Etsy, Ansible, um, modules, or in your local directory under the library's uh, directory name. Uh, or I'm sorry, library singular not plural so library in your local directory or within the directory of a role so if you've if you've defined a role and you have playbooks and stuff in there you can put library in there and put your custom modules in there and that will provide that functionality why did it get called library I don't know I, you, it's historic reasons I don't know maybe I mean that makes sense yeah that it might, yeah I like that I should probably ask Jimmy or, or Michael one day I've just always accepted it as truth and never really thought to ask why. Yeah, we just make a page, like documenting everything that has in history. Yeah, well, so it's funny actually because there's a handful of modules that, like, in their metadata, it's like version added, it just says historic. Like, because nobody knows. It's like it's been here since the dawn of time. We did sometime in the past. Yum is one of those. If you go in the version added uh, for yum, is, is historic. So I think yum uh, existed in, like, 0 0.2 or something in 0 0.1. It was forever ago. Um, yeah, so I, I had every intention to show a couple examples uh, in like actual code, um, but my Mosh connection, I probably should have just tethered my phone to make that better. Um, anyways, if you have questions, I'm around. I'm happy to like sit down and do some hackfest type things when we have like some time to break out if anybody wants to actually implement a plugin. Um, but hopefully, you know, so like one of the things that I, I always talked about um, is. Uh, performing automation tasks based on fed messages and that's something of like an idea and uh, I wrote a tool called loopable and that's been deployed in Fedora infrastructure I have no idea if it's actually being used these days um, but <clears throat> the idea was is to actually be able to marry um, a fed message event to a responsive uh, Fedora playbook and then use plugins to kind of exactly to be able to integrate more more tightly coupled um, or more natively with various services within f with the within the Fedora infrastructure to to kind of do those things. So um, hopefully, you know, throughout the Fedora project in different areas and different sub projects that I have zero visibility into, just because there's only so many hours in the day. Hopefully, this can be useful um, to kind of extend the functionality of Ansible to take your automation um, kind of in places you might not have thought it could. Cool. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.